something new that we've been looking at over the last three years has actually been uh, taking the double crop system a step further and double cropping soybeans behind corn. Typically our corn's coming off, um, you know, in August where we've got the capability to dry some grain. We've got some producers starting to cut at the end of July. We're talking soybean production across the South, but especially South Carolina on the AgNow Roundup that starts now. Well, good morning and welcome to the Ag Now Roundup. My name is Dave Deacon. It's kind of become uh, soybean talk on the show over the past few weeks. And this week we're heading to the great state of South Carolina where soybeans are the top planted crop from the 2023 season. And this week we have Dr. Michael Plumbly from Clemson University Extension to tell us more about soybean production in the Palmetto State. But first, let's take a look at the weather across the ag producing world from meteorologist Matt Makins. Time for the AgNow Weather Report. Matt Makins here. Remember last week and all that snow I was complaining about, or I guess I was complaining about the shoveling, not necessarily the water. We have a doozy of a system, well, actually two of them, headed to the upper Midwest, the northern plains, into parts of Iowa. More on that in a moment. This is the significant weather outlook for the next couple of weeks, and you see a lot on the map. So let's kind of dissect it, break it into some chunks. The biggest impactor covering the vast majority of the country is wind. So we have risks of high winds in all these highlighted areas, and this goes from the late part of the month into early April. What about precipitation impacts? We have those as well. There's the heavy snowfall area across the northern plains, the high plains of Montana, the upper Midwest. That's going to be heavy snowfall events the 24th to the 25th. We have heavy snowfall possible to wrap up the month in California as well as Colorado. We have risks for severe weather. That'd be thunderstorms around the 24th of March. Another batch of severe thunderstorms here. That'd be a couple of days later and heavy rainfall across the southeast. So precipitation wise we are entering a very active phase to wrap up March and for some of us to kick off April. There's another impact not highlighted here, and that is cold. If you're anywhere in the plains, calving, etc., watch out for late this weekend into early next week. You're going to have some abnormally cold temperatures moving through with some wind and also some moisture in some cases. So it could be too cold for some of the youngsters out there. Drought. This monitor was released this week. We're still worried about several areas, especially New Mexico, and the other one is Iowa. But for this part of Iowa, a lot of water is headed in. Let's check the animation and get through the next 10 days or so watching the storm flow. There's your clock set to mountain time. Big storm exits off to the east coast, but here comes one storm from Colorado toward Minnesota and the Great Lakes. That's going to dump a lot of water late this weekend through early next week. That storm continues to move into Canada and the New England states. Wrapped up on the south side of it will be some moisture for the southeast. A couple of days of break. Here we go Friday, Saturday, Sunday into Monday. Another big system will hit that same area. So you're going to have kind of a two-wave effect here wrapping up March and both of these waves will bring quite a bit of water. There's going to be a third one beyond it but that's at a pretty lengthy distance so let's just focus on kind of the next 10 days first. So total precip on the way a lot of the country is getting some precip except for the drought areas of New Mexico and West Texas into the Panhandle as well as far Southern California. The rest of the country will have at least a couple of raindrops if nothing less uh, or if nothing more excuse me. As you highlight this area here this is going to be the upper Midwest so we have Minneapolis there's Sioux Falls, uh, Fort Dodge down to Ames and Des Moines. That bullseye of water is going to be up to two, two and a half, perhaps three inches of total water on the way over the next 10 days. That's a lot of water for the time of year. Down to the south, here's Memphis to Jackson, Tupelo, Greenville. This area, this bullseye is also going to be around two and a half to three inches, if not more of water. Again, this comes with a risk of severe thunderstorms, though the damaging potential, whereas that last region, the Iowa area, Minnesota, that's going to be highly in the form of snowfall and deep snows at that. So let's focus on the snowfall map. We have a lot for the Rocky Mountain region, 
The high plains of Montana will pick up several inches, if not close to a foot to a foot and a half. Then let's look in here. Let's zoom that map in. And we're looking at areas of North Dakota, South Dakota, and here is Minnesota. The bullseye of the snow hits Minnesota, but you can see some of those deeper snows go off uh, to the west also. But this bullseye you see around St. Cloud and on up the interstate there, that's going to be 24 to 30, 30 to 36 inches, if not more than that. And that's going to be coming out of the next couple of waves, next storm systems. So it's not going to come all at once, but you're going to get a big chunk early in the week, perhaps a foot, foot and a half couple of days break and then watch for that secondary system to come through and almost double that total if not truly double it for that second system so a lot of water is on the way valuable area for that water too let's take a look at the weekly chunks here this is the 22nd to 29th of march 29th to the 5th of april and then week three and week four we're looking at areas of precipitation we're focusing here the central states, Mississippi states, and then we get into the second week, week two. Now we're focusing on Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, Kansas, Illinois. Week three and week four, things do get a little bit calmer. So as we get into middle April, that's when a drier pattern starts to emerge for a lot of the country. In terms of temperatures, watch out, as mentioned, for the cold that moves in this week, late this weekend and early next week. It lingers into week number two and kind of grows into the southwest. Week number three, week number four, we still have temperatures below average, but as far as abnormally cold or extremely colder than normal, those conditions start to subside as we go into uh, mid-April. So there was a lot to dissect in this week's Ag Now Weather Report. We'll have more on this impactful snow and very valuable moisture next week. Until then, Matt Nathans. Well, thank you so much, Matt. And by the way, congrats on being able to shovel all that snow last week without throwing out your back. I looked at the photos that you sent and it, it hurt my back just looking at them, but you did a great job with that. This week, we're continuing our conversation talking about soybean production across the United States because it is one of the most widely planted crops across the U.S. This week, we're taking a look at the soybean crop in the great state of South Carolina, where in 2023, soybeans were the top planted crop as far as acreage goes. And that means that we head to Clemson University to learn more about soybean production from Dr. Michael Plumley. Dr. Plumley, why is South Carolina a great state for soybean production? So soybean production in South Carolina really fits well in terms of a, a good crop rotation with our corn acres and cotton acres. Uh, we do a lot of uh, small grains and, and capitalize on the double crop and opportun opportunity that we have with soybeans. Um, and something new that we've been looking at over the last three years has actually been uh, taking the double crop system a step further and double cropping soybeans behind corn. Typically our corn's coming off, um, you know, in August where we've got the capability to dry some grain. We've got some producers starting to cut at the end of July. And rather than that land laying out fallow and having volunteer weeds or, or things like that, We've had some success with going in and planting soybeans directly behind the, the corn crop and still having enough of the growing season to make about 30, 40 bushel soybeans on irrigated ground in South Carolina. So That's pretty remarkable. So how, that's something you don't necessarily always hear about the uh, soybeans after corn. What are, are there different things that you have to do if, if you're going in after corn in such a short growing season? Uh, for the soybeans versus say another crop like wheat or, or, or something like that? For sure. Um, you know, that was kind of our take on this when we started researching and it was, you know, what can we do agronomically or what are some issues that we should be aware of for developing some best management practices for producers that wanted to do this? And uh, obviously one of the first things that we would you know recommend or have would be definitely needs to be on irrigated ground the majority uh, or a lot of our irrigated acres do go into corn and it's unfortunately a lot of times it's continuous corn um, just because of our sandy soil textures a lot of farmers would rather put corn with irrigation so by putting or having uh, the double crop system we're moving soybeans off of a traditionally dry land acre to an irrigated spot probably have better uh, fertility on these uh, acres. And so we have a little bit better of an opportunity to make some yield, but 
we've looked at things like planting date uh, for the soybean. You know, how late can we plant a soybean and still make a crop? Uh, right now, a lot of our data is suggesting as long as we get them in the ground by the, the end of the first week of August, we still probably have enough time. On average, we've looked at maturity group. Uh, so we've looked at uh, indeterminate four, maturity group four, five, six, and seven. Uh, by theory or in theory, by the book, you would think that the later you plant, the later the maturity group you would plant, at least in the south, uh, right. to kind of delay the time that we start to initiate blooming. But what we've learned with this uh, research is that really we just need to select the best variety that we have. And by the best variety, plant height is a critical component in this system to be able to com to get it in the combine. So we've, we've picked out a few maturity group fives that actually do better for us. They're real rank growing soybeans. Um, we've also looked at the nematode aspect of this where, you know, if we're going to plant soybeans following the corn, are we going to set ourselves up for a nematode disaster the following right. year? Uh, on a corn crop. So we've evaluated uh, granular nematicides in both corn and soybean and then a resistant soybean variety uh, to see if we can suppress some of the nematodes. And we've shown some pretty promising results where we're using a nematicide and just showing that they do, they are doing their job and the resistant varieties are doing their job too. So people that are really heavily in the system are really doing a lot of it. We are recommending that they don't you know, overlook the nematicide aspect or the resistant variety. But we've looked at seeding rate, um, row spacing, uh, all sort of different things. We pretty much just took the system and picked it apart as best we could to try to come up with some recommendations. And so we hope that after this year, we'll kind of conclude a three-year study and uh, be able to kind of have these recommendations put in our production guides and that sort of thing. That it's it is very intriguing the 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 soybean after corn are are there a lot of producers who are doing that or are showing interest in that? Yeah, so um, probably three or four years ago, our our best estimate is we probably only had a handful of growers doing it. You know, here, there, and yonder, maybe three to five thousand acres in the state were in this system. Um, we started researching it and kind of, you know, showing some preliminary results. We suspected that acreage went up to maybe 10,000 the next year. Uh, wow. Last year, we were probably at 20,000 plus acres. And I think there's enough interest to probably, you know, get it on up there even more than that. Um, I've got a couple of really progressive farmers that do this every year and have been doing it. And they're doing it across, you know, close to a thousand acres on their farm. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing that we're wanting to figure out is when we started this, we would ask a grower, you know, when do you decide to plant soybeans behind corn or not? Because there's got to be some inflection point that this is not profitable, you know, depending on drying cost, input price, you know, commodity price, et cetera. And a lot of the answers we were getting was, well, you know, if the price of uh, gas for drying was low and commodity prices were high for the corn, especially, you know, we would maybe try it, but we're trying to put a little bit better dollar figure to that, um, to, to, to give them something to go off of. But like I said, there's a lot of interest in this. Um, we've got a, a portion of the state that's heavily corn and soybean production. They're not growing a lot of cotton and peanuts that are competing with this. So for right. those guys, they're, really progressive they're you know they do a good job they've got big equipment they can get across the acres quick and uh there's a lot of interest in that particular area for sure so as a whole what what part of the state are you seeing more soybean production what you you kind of you kind of alluded to it there is it in the low country is it is it upstate so our state is kind of broken up into three different regions we've got the piedmont region which is uh, if, you're, if you're looking at our state, kind of Highway 1 and North, uh, more rolling hills, heavier clay soils. And then we've got the Coastal Plain. And really our Coastal Plain region, we divide into two separate areas. We have the Low Country, which is from the Santee Cooper Lakes south towards Georgia. And then we have the PD region, which is the Santee Cooper Lakes north towards North Carolina. Um, historically, a lot of our heavy corn, soybean counties have been in that pd region so from the lakes north towards north carolina um but we are seeing you know especially over the last couple of years when the price of corn was looking pretty good we were seeing you know more corn soybeans popping up uh we took a little hit on cotton acres in the state but i think this year with pricing uh we'll probably see our cotton go back up soybeans will probably stay about the same but corn's definitely going to take a hit 
Whenever it comes to uh, just full season soybeans, what what issues have you seen over the past couple of years, say with uh, with the uh, disease pressure, with insect pressure? Yeah, so um, full season beans in South Carolina, um, you know, typically probably being planted first of May through first week of June, just kind of depending on crop rotation, other crops that they're growing. Um, but luckily in South Carolina, we're kind of a low disease insect state, uh, which is kind of interesting. They have, it seems like they have a few more disease issues south of us in Georgia, maybe a few more pest issues uh, north of us in North Carolina. But really um, with us, probably the number one soybean disease that we look for every year and probably do a lot of fungicide applications for would be Asian soybean rust. Luckily for us, it does not overwinter in South Carolina, so it is overwintering in Florida. Um, we're able to kind of track the progression of it if it moves up with a hurricane or tropical storm across Georgia. So we can send out alerts to growers to say, hey, you know, we're fine. They're finding soybean rust right across the border. If you're, you know, at R3 growth stage starting to put pods on, you got good yield potential, maybe consider spraying the fungicide. If we're not finding any soybean rust, it's been a quiet year. You know, we often make recommendations on, hey, you know, uh, if you've got the right disease package with your variety, you know, we don't really have a big frog eye issue in South Carolina. We right. see it from time to time, uh, but not a huge issue. Um, you know, we often recommend don't spray a fungicide. In terms of pests, um, really, I'd say, I mean, we get most of the common three-cornered alfalfa hoppers early on um kudzu bugs obviously they're kind of hit or miss they're not as big of an issue as they once were um but we do see a uptick late season usually about the time that our fungicide sprays would be going out at r3 where we're starting to make some sprays for some lepidopteran pests so like soybean looper three corner or uh, uh green clover worm uh, velvet bean caterpillar you know just the whole complex but luckily for us usually one spray uh, especially if it's got some residual with it, we can kind of hold those back. Over the past few weeks, I've been talking with several soybean specialists across the country, and, and everybody has been talking about planting dates and, and some of the research that they're doing into planting dates. Are, are, are planting dates a, a, a big issue in South Carolina? Yeah, um, so planting, planting date maturity group, obviously, big topic, always has been. I think it's been researched, you know, pretty good for the last 20, 30 years, but we just conducted another study that we just concluded uh, actually last year where we looked at maturity group planting date in South Carolina in a dry land situation, a couple different locations, but we wanted to really push the bounds on planting date uh, to see, you know, if we shifted our planting dates earlier than historical or later, where we leave anything on the table or picking anything up. So we actually did a trial looking at four maturity groups planted every month from March through August, knowing that some might be too early, some might be too late. And really what we learned from this whole trial, at least in a dry land situation with average yield potential, you know, we're not shooting for 250 bushels uh, to the acre or anything like that. We actually see a yield penalty where we're planting in March in South Carolina. So earlier is not always better here. Um, and then obviously when we get to the end of July and into August, we're taking a, a significant hit on dry land acres as well. And really where our, our sweet spot was, was kind of this mid April through mid May region. So year in, year out, that's what we're recommending in terms of planting date. As far as maturity group, we have a lot of interest right now in indeterminate group fours, which has not historically been a maturity group that we've grown. They've had great success with that. In the Mid-South, uh, in, in increasing yields, we're not really seeing that, at least in the Southeast. I don't know if it's something to do with our soil texture and we're stressing the soybeans a little bit more than in the Mid-South. Our limited irrigated acres are just the varieties themselves. Very few of the fours have a uh, good nematode package, which a lot of our, our land has got nematode pressure. Um, but the quality aspect with the fours, we're just not seeing it. We see a lot of damage with these, with them not weathering well and that sort of thing. So really our recommendation moving forward for maturity group planting date is if you want to maximize yield in South Carolina, we're recommending planting a very good five or six maturity group soybean planted between probably April the 20th and May 15th.
Kind of back to what you were you, you were saying earlier about the, the the double crop possibilities behind corn. It, it, you're you're looking into that into a research study. Are there other uh, research uh, items that you're doing there in South Carolina? Oh uh, yeah, we're we're really expanding our research um, on soybean for sure. Looking at these early maturity groups, like I mentioned, there was a, there's a lot of interest in this. I think from a yield component. So we're looking at things, and this is actually a, a national effort. There's a group of soybean specialists together called the Science for Success uh, group that's funded by USB that um, has really taken a, a very applied base or, or applied approach on uh, tackling research objectives across the country. And so one of the things that we're looking at this year with that is going to be uh, – the impact of seed quality on soybean, where it's going to be some are just going to be delayed harvest dates to see, you know, if we're delaying harvest with a different maturity group, are we really compromising the quality of the soybean? But then we're also doing an additional trial to look at the desiccation timing. So it's not very uncommon in the South for these maturity group four indeterminate soybeans to be desiccated uh, at R6 and a half. So a little bit early uh, just to help speed up the dry down process, get them out the field and preserve some of the seed quality. So we're going to be looking at that as well. Uh, we just concluded a trial looking at biological seed treatments across the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. with that. So we participated in that as well. And then uh, I guess one of the last or new uh, projects that we'll be looking at this year is trying to quantify the nitrogen credits that we're getting off of soybean. So if you look right. at a lot of extension recommendations across the U.S., most production guides um you know vary in terms of what we're crediting a soybean crop and, and leaving in the soil so just state to state and we're trying to get a better handle on exactly what we are getting from that across the u.s well thank you so much dr michael plumbly with clemson university extension for going on with us we we we, we really appreciate it yeah for sure thank you for having me and of course, thank you for watching this episode of the Ag Now Roundup. If there's something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, say soybean production in South Carolina or any other previous episode that we've talked about, head over to our website, agnowtv.com. You'll be able to find uh, ways to connect with the extension professionals that we have on the show every week. And of course, you can also join our social media accounts, our email accounts, and of course, download the Ag Now app all available at agnowtv.com. Check it out all free of charge. From our farm to your farm, I'm Dave Deacon for Ag Now.